Welcome back, everyone, to another deep dive. And um, today we're looking at something I think a lot of you tech folks out there might be interested in. It's the U.S. economy. Yeah. And we'll be talking about the national debt and some pretty interesting solutions that have been proposed and even Bitcoin and Doge. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty wild mix of things going on right now. Yeah. The U.S. has this massive $35.7 trillion national debt, and it seems like everyone from Elon Musk to former President Trump to Wall Street CEOs are coming up with some radical ideas. Right. So let's start with the basics. Sure. What exactly is this financial emergency we keep hearing about? Right. Is it just hyperbole or should we actually be worried? I think there's definitely reason to be concerned. Look, almost a quarter of all the taxes the government collects goes just to paying interest on that debt. Wow. It's a trillion dollars a year, which is more than the entire Defense Department budget. Wow, that, that really puts it in perspective. Yeah. And this is where, I guess, David Friedberg's warnings come in, right? Right. He's talking about empires collapsing under the weight of their own debt. Exactly. Throughout history, when empires start spending more on just the interest on their debt than on basic services or investments. Yeah. It uh, it can be a sign that things are about to go downhill. Markets get nervous investors, look for safer places to put their money, and before you know it, things can spiral out of control. Okay, so that's the scary part. But what about the solutions that people are proposing? Right. Let's start with this Doge department idea. Okay. I mean, it sounds like a meme. It does. But I hear there's an actual plan behind it. There is, yeah. So tell me about it. The name is obviously a reference to Dogecoin and Elon Musk's, you know, love of it. But Howard Lutnick, he's the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald and actually led Trump's transition team. Okay. He's got some pretty serious proposals, mm -hmm. like cutting government waste, balancing the budget, and even using things like tariffs and selling natural resources to make money. Okay. I'm, I'm intrigued. But um, let's break this down. What would cutting government waste actually look like? I mean, it's easy to just say that. Right. But where would those cuts actually come from? Well, Letnick talks about things like government offices that aren't being used or procurement processes that are really inefficient, places where the government could be more streamlined and save money without actually cutting essential services. I see. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. I can see why that would appeal to a lot of people in tech who are, you know, all about efficiency and streamlining. Right. But wouldn't that be a huge undertaking? It would. It would be a massive project. And the government isn't exactly known for being very quick or adaptable. Right. So, yeah, it would take buy-in from a lot of different agencies, clear ways to measure progress, and a plan to deal with any pushback from people who benefit from the way things are now. So let's say they manage to cut the waste. Okay. What about balancing the budget? I mean, that seems even harder, especially when so much of the government's money is going just to paying interest on the debt. Yeah, it would definitely take a multi-pronged approach, like some combination of spending cuts maybe in things like defense or subsidies, yeah. and then some ways to increase revenue like tax reforms or those tariffs and resource sales that Lutnick talked about. Right. Speaking of tariffs and resource sales, uh -huh. I mean, that seemed pretty controversial. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't they have a big impact on the economy and even on international relations? Absolutely. Tariffs are basically taxes on imports. Right. They can help protect industries in the U.S., but they can also start trade wars and make things more expensive for consumers. Right. And selling off natural resources. Well, there are environmental concerns there and questions about what it means for the economy in the long term. So it sounds like this Doge Department strategy is interesting. Yeah. But it also comes with a lot of potential complications. It does. It does, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to something that I think a lot of our listeners, especially the tech folks, will be more familiar with. Right. And that's Bitcoin. Yeah. We've got Letnick investing a ton of money in it, El Salvador making it legal tender. Yeah. Even former President Trump is talking about Bitcoin. What's the deal with all this crypto buzz? It's it's really interesting, right? You have this digital currency that isn't controlled by any government, and some people mm -hmm. see it as a way to protect themselves against inflation. Right. While others are more skeptical, they point to how much the price jumps around and the fact that it's not really used that much in the real world. Right. And now it's being talked about as a way to deal with national debt and to shape economic policy. It's definitely something new. So let's dig into this a bit. Okay. What are the arguments for using Bitcoin to address national debt? I know some people think it could be a real game changer. The main argument is that there is a limited supply of Bitcoin. Right. Unlike regular currencies, which governments can just print more of whenever they want, yeah. there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. 
so that scarcity proponents argue makes it a good hedge against inflation because unlike dollars or euros yeah bitcoin can't just be devalued by a government printing more of it i mean that makes sense especially with inflation being such a big concern these days right but what about the fact that the price of bitcoin is so volatile yeah i mean it goes up and down all the time yeah wouldn't that make it really risky for a government to depend on? Yeah, that's the main criticism, and it's a valid one. Imagine a government trying to manage its budget with a currency that could suddenly lose half its value. Right. That kind of instability could make economic planning incredibly difficult. Yeah, and what about the technical side of things? Right. I mean, Bitcoin's infrastructure isn't really designed to handle the volume of transactions that a whole national economy would generate, right? Exactly. The current Bitcoin network can only process a certain number of transactions per second, and the fees can fluctuate wildly. Yeah. So to scale that up to handle the needs of a country like the U.S. would require huge technological advancements and a lot of infrastructure development. So it seems like the idea of using Bitcoin to deal with national debt is interesting on paper. Yeah. But in practice, there are some serious obstacles. Right. Yeah, there are. What about this proposal for a U.S. Bitcoin strategic reserve? Okay. How would that work and what would be the pros and cons? So the idea is based on the strategic oil reserves that a lot of countries have. Right. The government would basically buy and hold a lot of Bitcoin. Yeah. And they could use it to help stabilize the market if the price starts to fluctuate too much. Yeah. Or even just hold it as a strategic asset. Okay. But wouldn't that require a massive investment from the government? It would, yeah. yeah. And it's not clear how they would acquire that much Bitcoin without causing major disruptions in the market. And wouldn't it look pretty bad if the government started investing heavily in Bitcoin? Right. I mean, there's already so much skepticism about cr cryptocurrency. Exactly. It would raise all sorts of questions about whether the government is playing favorites or if there are conflicts of interest. Right. And it would make it seem like the government is endorsing a technology that a lot of people still see as risky and speculative. So it sounds like the idea of using Bitcoin whether to address national debt or as a strategic asset, is pretty complicated. It is. It definitely raises a lot more questions than it answers. Yeah. But I think for our listeners, especially those in the tech world, this is where things get really interesting. Right. You're the ones at the forefront of this technological revolution, the ones shaping the future of finance and innovation. Exactly. What do you all think about Bitcoin's potential to play a bigger role in the economy? Do you think it's a viable alternative to traditional financial systems? Yeah. Or is it more of a speculative asset? Think about the implications for the tech industry. If Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies were to become more widely used, how would that impact the development of new technologies? Right. Would it lead to greater financial inclusion and access to capital? Or would it create new risks and challenges that we haven't even thought of yet? These are really important questions, and they don't have easy answers. But we need to be asking them and debating them and ultimately doing something about them. This deep dive has definitely given us a lot to think about. It has. But before we wrap up, there's one more fascinating piece of this puzzle we need to explore. Okay, so we've talked about the Doge Department and Bitcoin, but you said there's one more piece of the puzzle. Yeah, we've been discussing all these potential solutions to this financial emergency. Right. But what if the real problem goes deeper than just economics or technology? Right. What if it's a symptom of a bigger societal issue? Okay, I'm listening. What kind of societal issue are you talking about? Well, think about it. This massive national debt. It's partly because we've been overspending for decades. Yeah. We have this culture of wanting everything right now, and we don't seem to care that much about the long-term consequences. So you're saying it's not just about balancing the budget. It's about changing our values as a society. Exactly. Uh, what if the key to a truly sustainable future isn't just about finding new ways to get rich, but about changing our whole idea of what wealth really means? Mm -hmm. What if it's about things like well-being and community and a more balanced approach to consuming and using resources? That's a pretty big shift in thinking. It is. But I can see how it would resonate with a lot of people in the tech world, especially those who are passionate about using technology to solve real-world problems right, right. and create a more sustainable future. It's a conversation that's starting to happen, and I think our listeners, especially those who are tech-savvy, are in a unique position to contribute. Right. You're the innovators, the disruptors, the ones who are constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Exactly. Yeah. So as we wrap up this deep dive, I want to leave our listeners with a challenge. Hmm. We've explored the economic realities, the potential solutions, and the broader societal implications of this financial mess. Right. Now it's your turn. 
If you were in charge, what would you do? Would you focus on those practical policy solutions like the ones Lutnick proposed? Yeah. Or would you try to change people's values and priorities like we just talked about? What role do you see technology playing in all of this? Can it help create a more sustainable and equitable future? Or will it just make existing inequalities worse? These are tough questions, and there are no easy answers. But we need to be asking them and discussing them and ultimately taking action. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive. We hope it's given you some food for thought and inspired you to keep exploring these important issues.